song, then we'll get started, man. Oh, yeah. And we are live here on the roundtable on HamiltonRadio.net channel HR2. My guest just looked up like he fell asleep during the theme song. But he made it here. And I'm very, very excited to have this man on because it's different from guests that I normally get to have. You know, I normally have, you know, comedians, musicians, people like that. I don't normally get athletes on. And I don't think I've ever had you know, somebody from fitness that is in, you know, the powerlifting strongman world. So this is definitely going to be an interesting show for me, especially because this man got to pick the brain of one of the greatest bench pressers of this generation, if not the greatest of all time, in Julius Maddox. The guy has a raw 782-pound bench press. There are guys out there that would be happy if they did a quarter of that. So <laughs> this man, I I would be happy if I could do that because because I, I I I've I've still got a few hundred pounds to go before I get to seven eighty two, but you know I'm really excited to be able to pick this man's brain, you know, see what he's learned throughout his stretch in fitness and also what he learned from Julius. But very very excited to have this man here, Big Tommy Burns. How you doing, yes, man? Sir. Man, I'm fantastic, brother. Fantastic. Thank you for the intro and definitely uh, glad to be here. Yeah, for sure. hundred percent. But I noticed, too, you dip in like the strongman lifts as well. So if mm -hmm. you could honestly clarify for me, which one do you prefer? Do you prefer powerlifting? Do you prefer doing the strongman stuff? What's the preference for you? For me personally, I'm a, I'm a strongman to my heart, man. Okay. Uh, since I was seven, seven years old, that's all I wanted to do is be really? literally be strong, man. Mm -hmm. So you were so for so from seven years old, you were just watching those guys on TV, oh, you know, yeah. doing all the different things they do with the Atlas Stones, the log lift. I see you for love sure. the log lift a lot too, man. Is that a favorite of yours? Oh yeah, oh yeah, uh, definitely one of the favorites, man. I would say it's probably. Out of the top five is probably number two. Number one would be the giant tire flip for me, man. So okay, yes. Yeah, so, so strong man started when I was uh, literally a kid watching. I was last year I was seven years old. I was I was that kid that would sit up and watch all the reruns on ESPN and you know all that type of stuff, man. So uh, I, I literally been seven years old saying, "One, well, I'm gonna be that big. I'm gonna be that strong, and I'm gonna do that." So here we are today. <laughs> So I don't know uh -huh. how old you are, but, you know, back in the day, there were guys like Bill Kazmaier that were, you know, tearing it up every time, you know, they got into a strongman competition. For those who don't know, Bill Kazmaier was actually so strong that he got banned from competing in the competition after this man won three times straight by a wide margin. So, you know, who are some of the strongmen that you watch? Because I don't know how old you are. I don't know if Bill Kazmaier is one of them. I don't know what they are. So tell me a little bit about some of the strongmen that you watched that yes. made you want to do this. So so for me growing up, man, definitely watching the, the reruns from the late 70s and the 80s uh, with with Bill Kazmaier and Jeff Capes, you know, right. John Paul Sigmundson. Um, mm -hmm. You know, those were the guys that that really, really uh, in the early days, you know, I was born in the, in the mid 80s. So they okay. were competing okay. way before I, I was even born. So <laughs> to watch those reruns was awesome. But then coming into the 90s, you know, you had uh, guys like Magnus Ver Magnuson, who was a smaller right. guy, you know, compared to the rest of the athletes. But he would just outperform everybody who just prepared himself so well. 
and was just uh, a well-rounded guy. He was able to, you know, win four World Strongest Men uh, titles without being the biggest guy. I'm pretty sure without yeah. being, you know, the strongest guy. You know, people like him, and uh, of course, when we get into the, the decade of the 2000s, you know, you got to throw Marius Fusanowski in there. You know, oh, yeah. early oh, yeah. oh, yeah. you, you, you can't <laughs> talk about strong man without Marius, the five-time yeah. world strongest man. And then, of course, a little bit later, getting into it with, you know, with Brian Shaw and, the, yeah. you know, uh, Sovikis. And, and then you get into, you know, the last five years or so where we talk about the Eddie Halls and the Thors. Yeah, and, man. You know, the Martins and, you know, people like that, man. But my favorite of all time is a guy who never won, probably should have won, in okay. my opinion, but in 1990, World's Strongest Man, a guy named O.D. Wilson. They call okay. him the night Uh-huh. All right. That was my guy. All right. You know who I think is going to go down as somebody that's, you know, going to be so underrated 20 years from now? You brought up Eddie Hall. And he mm -hmm. won in 2017. You know, I think, you know, that was going to be his year. It was right after he did the half-ton deadlift. So, you know, I think it just, you know, makes a lot of sense with how strong he got, especially in the short amount of time he did. But I think it's going to be looked at as something that was vastly underrated. I think partially it's going to be, you know, because, you know, Half Thor decided to call him out. I think another part of that is, you know, his grind about how he was trying to win for, you know, about five years, years yeah. and, you know, how he crept up closer and closer and closer every single year. And mm -hmm. he retired right after he won. And I think uh -huh. just the way everything went down, all the events, it's a shame too, because, you know, that was probably one of the greatest lineups in strongman history. But I think when, you know, you look back at it, I think it's going to be looked, I think it's going to be one of the more underrated wins, I think, like 20 years from now. Oh, yeah. I, I Well, I, I don't know about underrated. I don't I definitely wouldn't see a lot of people uh, 20 years from now. I don't think people would have the attachment of the storyline for Eddie yeah. Hall. Like, you brought up his, that, that five years before winning, you know, he, he was right. literally – the poster child of strongman and he uh that they were able to literally ride the back of eddie hall I'm talking about right. all of us you know world strong man and all of us because of his personality his charisma but also yeah. his sacrifice dedication to the sport and say you know i'm going to win this or i'm going to die you know yeah. and i think what makes him such a uh what makes that that half ton deadlift so great that's not you supposed know, to be possible awesome. Man, I, I put that right up there. Uh, the same thing, you know, we, we opened up talking about Julius Maddox, man. I, I put Julius Maddox going for the 800-pound deadlift it, on the same pedestal as that half-ton deadlift for Eddie right. Hall. And I put that half-ton deadlift on the same pe uh, pedestal as Roger Bannister going for the four-minute mile. Yeah. And breaking the four. Like, these are things that stretch human potential. You know, these are not just regular lifts or something that was more common. Once Eddie Hall did that, then all of a sudden we've seen deadlifts go up across the world in every yeah. strongman competition yeah. where it it wasn't <laughs> nowhere near that. For sure. Eddie Hall did that. No, know. because, you know, once everybody saw that, they saw that like, holy shit, this is possible. And I don't think anybody thought, you know, 500 kilogram deadlift was possible before, you know, Eddie Hall decided, you know what, I'm going to try to do this 500 kilogram deadlift. And it's crazy, too, because when he talks about the story about it, you know, he talks about getting stuck at like 470, 475 around that level. And, you know, he wasn't able to get past that point. And he tried to figure out why. And apparently, you know doctors or whoever was telling them like this is the limit like your body is going to so yeah. he had to you know try to figure out he had to go get therapy to try to figure out how he could get in the right mindset to be mm -hmm. able to lift you know the half ton and i don't think to this day he's come out with you know what he had to think about but he just said it's something very very dark to get him like really angry really pumped to be able to do something like that. And the crazy thing, you know, if you watch it enough, you can actually see 
his eyes go red during the deadlift. You know, you see the blood in the nose. And, Mm -hmm. you know, when you hear the whole story, you know, that's how you get the picture of how dedicated Eddie Hall was to the sport. But I think, you know, the details of it for people that kind of just know on the surface, I think a little bit of that is going to be lost to time. And that's the shame that I think, you know, is, you know, resulted from it. You know what I mean? Right. Right. And I, but what's, what's incredible though, is the age that we live in now and technology and things right. like what you're doing right, right now. I, I think that these things will move that story has the potential. I should say okay. to move that story along as time goes on. Like, right. you know, I, it's just, it's just recently, you know, with a lot of uh, studies and looking back into kind of like the, the early days of strong men. And I'm talking about literally the, the late seventies and eighties when I realized how big John Paul Sigerson was. So Eddie Hall, what Eddie Hall was to this age of strong men in the last yeah. decade, that was John Paul Sigerson, you know, for the rest of the world in the eighties. And so he became a, you know, because of his, his personality, his celebrity, of course, in his own home country, but he, he became such a big deal that it moved strong men, you know, ahead. And uh, I, I think it's important that a lot of a lot of us, people like myself, who, are, who don't just compete in strong men, but are actually students of the sport, uh, love the sport, and also host competitions. Uh, it's up to people like myself and people that are in my circle to make sure that those uh, those details stay intact because they're important, man. Right. They're important. And when you talk about Eddie Hall, man, he's He's easily one of my favorite strongman athletes of uh, the last 20 years, easily because of that level of sacrifice, man, that yeah. level of, you know, willing to get it done uh, no matter what. And, and you know, he he retired right afterwards, <laughs> like he said he was going to do. That was it, man. That was it. He literally had to get – he couldn't get any bigger. He couldn't get any stronger. And if he would have kept competing – and you know, if he, well, he would have kept competing at that level, he absolutely would have died. <laughs> he probably wouldn't have been as competitive, man. He was, you know, they, they say he's six foot three. I've never <laughs> met him in person, but they say he's six foot three. I, I got yeah. a feeling that he's, he might be yeah. six one in real life. I, I, was, I believe it. I believe they probably put yeah. that up just a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And he was, he was 440 pounds. At six foot one, when he won the world strongest man in t- 2017, you can't fit anything anywhere else after that. <laughs> yeah. Like, like, like you look, yeah. like you look at the man. You're like, where, where do you fit anything if you're gonna try to get stronger after that? <laughs> right. And you know, for that guy, he didn't grow up to, as a big kid. Like I grew up, I no. was a big kid. You know, he, he, when he first started strong man, he may have been. You know, just over two hundred pounds. He he was a middleweight for yeah. sure, like a middleweight, yeah. uh, like around two thirty, two thirty uh, or under. And right. to grow right. ten years from two thirty to you know four hundred and forty pounds. <coughs> yeah, he was supposed to be a swimmer. Yeah, right, right, which I think <laughs> helped him a lot. Right, but I that's think a, helped that's him a, a hell lot of a change, man. Yeah. Oh man, that's crazy, but. I got to know, since we're talking about that, who are you taking in this fight in September? Eddie Hall or Half Thor? Oh, man, I'm going with Hall. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'm going I with see, Hall, man. I, I, I hate it when I go to the gym and I get into this conversation with people because I know a lot of people that are taking Half Thor. I'm like, no, it's not happening. Like, I, I just don't think they're going about it in, you know, the same way. When you see... Because I've, I've tried to follow, like, the training that they do for it. And when you see Eddie Hall doing it, you see him going all in every time he puts something up. When you see Hathor doing it, I just feel like he's going through the motions. You oh, know yeah. what I mean? Because he got yeah. that strong man win the next year. And, you know, for Eddie, this is just something that he can't put to bed because he took the glory away from him almost. You know, because this is a guy that was on Game of Thrones. And, uh-huh. you know, and I feel like half Thor, I feel like looking at what I've seen, he mentally has kind of put it to bed on his own, even though, you know, he's accepted the fight. And that's the feeling that I get 
you know, from watching these two train and try to go about having this fight. And, and Eddie is still brewing <laughs> from uh, from Thor saying that he, you know, that, that the refs gave him the world's strongest man title in 2017, which is he, which is ridiculous because he, he just he literally outperformed everybody. In those kept in that list of events. One of the rules is that you can't double dip. And this I actually watched recently because I figured we were going to talk about this. But one of the rules, you know, during the Viking press is that you can't double dip, which means no bending at the knees. If you see, if you watch the video, you see how stable Eddie's hips are along with his knees. When you watch Thor lift, you see that he's not very, very stable. And I feel like you might have had a disadvantage at that event anyway, because I feel like when you're taller, you got more distance to travel. It's harder to keep things stable, which, yeah. I mean, you know, four, 14 reps on that event, you know, is incredible, you know, when uh -huh. you look at it like that. And, you know, the dude, you knew the dude was going to win strong, man, because, you know, you look at the guy, you know, 6'9", 450, mm -hmm. you know, dude, dude's an incredible physical specimen. But, like, you watch the video and it's like, I know you want to win, but where are you trying? What are you, where is your argument right now? Mm -hmm. Like, I, I look back at it and, you know, it's just, it's just crazy to me. But, <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I, I wish I could get under that and do 15 reps, you know, but I would yeah. obviously have to get trained in strongman first. But, uh, but, where was I even gonna go after that? Um, well, I got something for you. So a lot of uh, a lot of people would uh, I, I bring I have to bring this up all the time when I'm having conversations about this particular uh, series of events with uh, Hall and Hector. You know, a lot of people have claimed that that was the most controversial World Strongest Man finals or sequence. <laughs> You know, the history of the world's strongest man. And I'm like, yeah, nah. Mm, no, you know, maybe, no. Maybe in modern or recent, you know, maybe. History. All right. If yeah. we go back, we, you, you opened up talking about, you know, Bill Kazmaier, who. He got banned know, from World's Strongest Man. Yeah, for, for being too strong. <laughs> that, that's the whole point of the event. How do you get banned for excelling at something? Yeah, yeah for being I'm too trying strong. Trying to figure so, that out. A few months ago, I posted a, a, a TikTok, and it was just a quick one-minute synopsis of uh, what I consider the most controversial world's strongest man. Like, it, was, it was my first ever video that ever got over a million hits because <laughs> there was so much controversy behind it. You know, yeah. people arguing on either side. And it was the 1990 world's strongest man with O.D. Wilson and John Paul Sigmundson won that event. Uh, world's strongest man. It was his fourth title, but John Paul Sigmundson, great athlete, incredible specimen, incredible persona in the world of strongman, a legend, absolutely. But he should have three titles. <laughs> right. So right. It, it goes. It goes that O.D. Wilson. So all these guys used to travel together and compete together uh, at this time. So they would go from competition to competition, world strongest man to the Highland Games to the whatever was coming up. They would all travel together, kind of like on a tour, like a strong mentor, right? And so here's this, this powerlifting guy who comes into the mix, mix within a, just a couple of years, six foot six, 400, easily 400 to 440 pounds on any given day, you know, wears a size 23 shoe, a size 23 ring, <laughs> called O.D. Wilson. They called him the nightmare. And they see how strong he was. He, of course, he was a world record powerlifter. Um, but they see just how strong uh -huh. this dude was on that tour, right? And so they get the world's strongest man that's in Finland. And all of the events were tailored to have John Paul win because they were more athletic events, more movement events, a lot of loading events and things like that. So nobody, nobody dreamed that OD had a chance to win that world's strongest man title because there were so many moving events. Well, we get to the final day of world's strongest man and OD Wilson is up by five and a half points with one event left in the entire competition. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows what the event is yet until we get to 
the actual event. Uh, and once they show it, they they pan the camera to a 200 meter track. And what they had to do was carry 220 pounds of bricks or 100 kilos of bricks around the 200 and uh, 200 meter track. O.D. Wilson's already 400 plus pounds. And the only way that John Paul could win is he had to come in absolute first and O.D. Wilson had to come in absolute last. Oh, but no. what did he do to make that happen? And so John Paul ends up winning that world's strongest man competition by half a point because that scenario played out just that way. <laughs> So I guess people look back at that and, you know, they kind of just figured, you know, let's put this event here so he could come out with it. Oh, it was, I mean, the the, the whole competition was in John Paul's favor. Like it was, uh, so years later, uh, there was a book written called Giants and Legends. And this is a, the book writ, was written, um, the author was one of the founders of World Strongest Man. And so he uh, he's a guy that comes from Highland Games background and would host all the Highland Games. And he talks about how they organized and started World Strongest Men. And he talks about his, you know, his his stories of being with all these guys, man. And there's a, a one chapter in there called The Nightmare. And he talks about how, you know, how big this guy was, how people looked at him when they traveled together. And then once he gets to this this part about the World Strongest Man. In 1990, he himself, who was also best friends with John Paul Sigmundson, he himself <laughs> says in a book that, yes, the fans wanted their guy to win. So they put all of these series of events together in order to make sure that John Paul had, you know, the upper hand as, you know, not just for other athletes, but particularly for the mighty strong <laughs> O.D. Wilson. <laughs> So they so they pretty much came out and said it. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I'll tell you what though, they must have been panicking when you know they saw how that scenario had to play out exactly when we get to that because they're thinking you know if this man comes into second to last, he's winning world strongest man. Mm. Mm -hmm. So, like mm -hmm. I can only imagine if you put that together and you're thinking about that, how Od Wilson has you panicking. Yeah, man. What I mean, you know, it has to be like, man. What, what can we do <laughs> within the realm of strong man to make this scenario plan out the way we need it to happen? I'll tell. I'll tell you this. Od Wilson probably would have been banned next after Bill Kasmeyer had he won. Oh man. Oh <laughs> man. Oh man. Yeah. I, I can see it now. All right. Yeah. I'm gonna put you on the spot though, with you know strongman competition in general who do you think is the goat of strongman because i think it's one of those things where you could put a few guys up there including bill kazmaier magnus for magison you know mm -hmm. uh i always i always get him mixed up with the five-time world strongest winner but you put you put him out there you know about 20 minutes ago but i always get him mm -hmm. and the five-time world strongest winner mixed up Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. you know, there's Brian Shaw, modern day, who's also got four strongman titles. That man's still looking for a fifth. But mm -hmm. who do you think is the goat? Man, the goat for years upon years, I said that it was uh, that that it was Bill. You know, I I still stick with that. But I would love to see Bill and Marius Fudanowski go head head to head, man. Yeah, so man. It, if if I take Bill Kazmaier out of that, because we wasn't able to see how dominant this guy was. He, he never got yeah. to display that. They, you know, they banned him. Not only did they ban him for, you know, after that third win. So he took, uh, what, 80, 81, and 82. So 83, he couldn't compete. He they, they banned him for like four years. And he couldn't come back until, you know, 88 when they had World Strongest Man. And so yeah. we never had a chance to really see the full – not necessarily dominance, but just the full realm of what this guy could have done. Uh, yeah. Now, Mark Zanowski, on the other hand, you know, we got a chance to see his storyline play out in World Strongest Man. Even though, you know, one one comp contest, they they uh, they 
banned them for substance abuse <laughs> and then said that uh <laughs> they got him for substance abuse and then he couldn't compete the following year but then came back and ended up winning the uh yes it ended up winning the world strongest man title again so he had five times so we got a chance to see his story pan out and play out but he was another person that was just so dominant that you know he would win he, even till this day he has the largest point margins of wins against any competitors and he wasn't competing against some you know some rudies no. he was competing against people no. like brian shaw like Sir julius yeah. vickers people that you know that we 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 know very well yeah in this dead time you know so yeah it was uh <laughs> i i would i would still have to say just because my heart is there i, I have to say uh bill kasmeyer to go yeah no nah, for sure I think I think you know the fact that we couldn't see his story play out kind of adds to you know the legend of him. But all right, so you were talking about stories panning out right there. You think Brian Shaw is going to win one more World Strongest Man title before he hangs it up? Because I feel like he's chasing just one more, and then he's going to decide to. But what do you think on that? Yeah, I think I think you're absolutely right. Uh, he's he's definitely chasing. Uh, that fifth title has been doing it for a while, but um, it's it he, it it's possible. It's absolutely possible. Yeah. What's going to determine that though is what events they decide is going to be a world strongest man. Yeah. Right. So Novikov won last year world strongest man, and a lot of people said, "Oh, th that's because there was a lot of moving events." But Novikov is strong as hell. <laughs> you can't take that away from the guy. He's under 300 pounds and just ridiculously strong and has gotten stronger every every time. And he's young, right? And but then they had the first Shaw Classic last year, which was a set of kind of different events. You would compare that to kind of like World Strongest Man being movement stuff to the Arnold Classic being more static sprint. So when Shaw put on the uh, Shaw Classic, the first one, that was a good mixture of stuff. And Brian Shaw was able to beat a lot of those people even though he competed at world strongest man and didn't even podium you know so yeah it was just it's it's a fascinating mix right now so it really yeah. depends on yeah. the events they decide it's going to be at world strongest man i feel like they're going with a little bit more of the movement events recently and that's why past couple years you know we've seen these lighter guys you know these guys that don't have as much size on them you know like martin's licious you know, Alexei Novikov this year, like you said, which let me just say that man's 18 inch deadlift was just ridiculous. ridiculous. Like, they're there, like, especially because you said he's under 300 pounds, you know, with the 18 inch start to a deadlift, you're, you're lifting like 540. Yeah. That's insane. Yeah, yeah he's, he's, he, he's a, he's a, he's somebody. Beast. He, he is somebody. I have not seen on the scene in Strongman in a very long time. Yeah. And he has a chip on his shoulder, too. Oh, yeah. Meaning that it's there's funny. a lot of people that was questioning, you know, the win from World Strongest Man, talking about the strength and the movement and stuff like that. And then he comes out and uh, what, what was the, the World Strongman, uh, World Ultimate Strongman ha happened a few weeks ago. Okay. And it was uh, – event that was that's just as heavy, you know, as the world's strongest man and Arnold Classic. And he wins that. And he and not a, he didn't do bad at the Shaw Classic either. He podium in the Shaw Classic. <laughs> so he yeah, so he's somebody that not only is he strong, not only is he athletic, but he has a uh the mentality of I got something to prove. And yeah. if we haven't had we haven't had a uh, – I'll have to go back and double check it, but right off, my, right off the top of my head, it's been a while since we had somebody go back-to-back, -back, you know, wins in World's Strongest Man. So this is going to be super yeah. fascinating and big if we can put it off. You got me trying to think of who that last person was because it has been a while. It would have to be between Shaw or Zadrinus. Those are only one two. Of, one of those? Okay. Uh-huh. Yeah, because I I know that I know there was somebody before Kazmaier because I was back forty years ago now, so it had. Oh, yeah. But yeah, you 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 got you got you probably right. It was either Shaw or Zavikas, one or the other. Um, yeah. but yeah, 
you know, you talked about in the beginning of the show being interested, you know, in strong man since you were seven years old. You know, obviously you weren't doing a lot of strong man stuff back then. So how did you get mm-hmm. into strong man to start off in the first place? Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, man. So so I told you a story about being that seven year old kid. And it was actually watching uh, O.D. Wilson. I bring him up a lot because it, it literally that's the reason I got into Strong Man. I saw somebody that looked like me, another brother, who was actually doing something in Strong Man. He finishes his first event at this uh, this competition. He looks into the camera after they ask him, how, how was that event? He was talking about how tough it was. And he looks into the camera and he says, I just want to say for all the kids out there watching, you want to grow up and be a strong man. It's good stuff. And so Big Tommy Burns at seven years old is watching that <laughs> at 156 pounds at seven years old, right? So I'm super huge myself, right? I'm too young to play with the big kids and, uh, you know, uh, with the older kids and too big to play with the younger kids. And I'm watching this and I'm watching stuff like wrestling and, you know, all, I'm like, that's what I'm going to do. So 42 years later, here I am about to turn uh, – I just turned 29. And it was right before okay. my 30th birthday. And strong man, you know, I experienced life and played football and, you know, played collegiate football a little bit of arena football as well. And, uh, but strong man has never left me. I only played football, so that I could work out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that, that'll get you involved in that. Yeah. I started playing football in, in 11th grade, was never a fan and didn't even watch it before that, just because the coach told me that. If I didn't try out for the team that year, I wouldn't be able to come back to the weight room. <laughs> so I said, where's practice, coach? Right? And so yeah. that, that opened doors for me to travel the country and, you know, play football and, and have opportunities. But, man, lifting weights and being strong and wanting to do and pursue strong men never left me. Uh, so here it was just for my 30th birthday. And I said, man, if I'm getting older, about to hit this, you know, this benchmark of 30 years. And if I'm going to do this, I need to figure it out. You know, right? Yeah. And so yeah. it was almost like, you know, a miracle happened at that point because literally as I'm looking up stuff, I start Googling how to do strong men. And I'm thinking, you know, the only way for me to compete strong men is to go compete at the world's strongest man level. So I start looking up stuff of how to get to world's strongest man. What just so happened, that was a social media, uh, you know, post from somebody at that time. I was living in the, the East Coast in the D.C., Maryland area, that there was Maryland, Maryland's strongest man coming up, a local competition. I had no idea that there was local competitions, right? And so I w- went out to watch that. It was only like three weeks off from the time I seen the post. Um, I figured I'd go out and watch it and then compete in it the following year. Well, I went out there, watched it, loved it, fell in love. It was my place, my space, my environment. And uh, somebody there was promoting a competition that they were putting on about four months later. And uh, so I competed in that one in 2014. So that ended up being my first competition in uh, Virginia, Vienna, Virginia, over at the Edge 2.0, my man Barry Vines out there. So super shout out to Barry Vines for opening the door. And so now I that, that same year, I relocated to the San Francisco Bay Area. And uh, since 2016, 2017, not only have I been competing every year, but I've also been hosting competitions every single year as well. Okay, so basic. So this was actually more recent than I thought it was. I didn't even know about anything, you know, about you playing for the Arena Football League or any of that. So. I mean, you know, what made you want to keep, you know, playing football, though? Because you said you weren't like a fan of it, but, you know, you ended up going into it in college. You did, you know, again, the Arena Football League. Was that just, you know, a way for you to keep working out? Like, this is, you know, helping me to keep that up. So let's keep doing it. Yeah, man. When you when you (laughs) when you grow up uh, like I did from a place I did, I'm from Flint, Michigan, man. So when you grow up. Uh, from you know, from the streets and in the hood and all that type of stuff. Right. It, the goal is to get a meal ticket, right? To find this meal ticket, right? And so, right. Uh, since I had played football, wasn't a huge fan of it, didn't watch it. But since I was had some size, I figured that it was a gift, and it did open some doors for me to start traveling because I'd never been outside of the city. 
before I started, you know, pursuing college. And I never thought about college before I started playing football. So it, it really over expanded my mind was a, a kind of like a, a vehicle to get me from one place to the next, sort of like right. a jump off right. another vehicle to get me to the next place. And, you know, ultimately to where as a kid, I would imagine that I would end up and that's in the world of strongman. All right, gotcha. It kind of, you know, went from one thing to another, and then it led to this. I got it. But, you know, how did I do want to know how you got into, you know, doing the interview with Julius Maddox because, you know, I'm sure you learned a lot from that. And, you know, I did want to learn about you, but I do want to, you know, talk about that just a little bit. How'd that even happen? Oh, man. Julius, Julius is good people, man. <laughs> yeah. Julius is good people. Even as strong as he is. He's super underrated. And I think that a lot of people, uh, I think that a lot of people won't recognize it until he's uh, he's actually done. And I'm one of the people that actually reached out to him, not just through social media, you know, reaching out saying, you know, man, how great you are. But I actually offered, you know, my assistance with him, not in training or anything else, but I also wanted to have him out to some of our events and things like this. This is, of course, pre-COVID. So just really reaching out and seeing how I could, uh, I'm, I'm a big, one, one of my core values is service, man. So I'm huge on seeing how I, how much service I could offer um, without asking anything, uh, just to build relationships with people and to see them do well. And uh, I think he felt that from the very first time that I reached out to him, started uh, chatting with him. Not a lot of people was just shortly after he broke the, the broke the national record for the United States of America. And because uh, I've been following, you know, Eric Spoto and, you know, many, right. I've been right. powerlifting for a long time. And of course, the bench press, you know. Um, yeah. yeah, so I've been following that stuff for a long time, man. But I see something in, in, in him that, I had not seen before, buddy. <laughs> and that was that breaking the world record was just, the, it was like the beginning. That was, Whereas yeah, everybody yeah, yeah, else yeah. breaking the, the best press world record, it was like, ah, this is all I got. For him, yeah. it was like, I got more. Oh, that was so really much done. more. Than that. <laughs> and so, and that's so, so the, yeah. That's, what you, that's yeah. what you don't normally see, too. Like, Okay, I got this. Let me move far. Let me move farther and farther ahead of everybody else, till they can't catch up. It almost seems like. Oh man! It, like just it, having I, fun with it. That's it. And for for Jew, you know, it's not even uh, it's the, it's not even about him competing with anybody. It's literally him and himself, and he's just trying to see how far he can push himself to be the best and give all that he's he's gotten before he's like. Okay, I'm done with this. I'm ready to move to something else. That's that's and why I, I love. It. That's why I love the gym, man. Too, you know, especially when you go by yourself, because it's just you with your thoughts, and the only person you're comparing yourself to is you that came in the gym yesterday, and you're just trying to beat what you did maybe yesterday, last week, last month, or whatever. You know, that's you know all you're trying to do when you go in the gym, and you know that's why. I think I gravitated to it. I didn't have to compare myself to anybody. You know, it could just be me and me doing what I do, you know, the very best I can every single time that I step in there and, you know, you know, given everything I got so I could be honest with myself afterwards. You know what I mean? Right. Right. That's it, man. Yeah, man, for sure. But, I do want to say, man, I appreciate you coming on, definitely for sure. You know, I appreciate being able to pick your brain about all this kind of stuff, you know, strong man in general, your journey, your conversations, you know, with Julius, because that's where I ended up, you know, finding out who you are. And, nice. you know, I'm really happy you just decided to come on and, you know, I could have something completely different on my show once again. So thank you, man. Yeah. I really, really appreciate you taking the time out. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. No problem. Anytime. And I definitely appreciate you guys as well, man. You normally, you, so you, your show normally consists of uh, comedians and other people. Yeah. Yeah. I've been doing stand up comedy myself for a little bit over three years now. So nice. I've been able to connect with a bunch of people that live out in the city 
up in Connecticut, you know, Western Mass. And through, mm-hmm. you know, the pandemic, you know, it's it's been a blessing in disguise in this way because, you know, through Zoom, I've been able to connect with people, not even just all over the United States, but all over the world. There's people that, you know, mm-hmm. I know from you know, Idaho, Phoenix, you know, up in New Hampshire, you know, down south, you know, L.A., mm-hmm. You know, there's one from London, another one from France, another person from India. You know, there's somebody, I think, from Malaysia, but that one I'd have to double check. But, you know, I've been able to connect with people pretty much everywhere through this, man. And that's been a blessing in disguise. But, you know, because I've been following this and, you know, what, I like that you're a wrestling fan, too. I got to have you back on to talk about wrestling for sure. Oh, Uh, man, for sure. All right, who's your who's your favorite wrestler? Just really quick. Man, I I, I go with the popular guy. Man, I'm I'm a fan of The Rock. The Rock. <laughs> hey man, yeah. I like Stone Cold, so I'm with that. There we go. I like Same era, man. <laughs> yeah, no, Stone Cold my, is my favorite of all time. The Goat is the Undertaker, though. The Goat is definitely the Undertaker. Absolutely. Yeah, all all, all we talked about sacrifice, all the sacrifice this man put in literally wrestled past the point where he couldn't even walk. Right. Yeah. So all that sacrifice to him, I can't picture anybody else as the goat. You know, I love Shawn Michaels. I love Rick Flair. I love Bret Hart, but to me, it's gotta be the undertaker, man. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, And one of the people that's on my, my dream 100, Dream 100 meeting that somebody I absolutely uh, aspire to meet and uh, pick their brain one day, you know, maybe have dinner with Vince McMahon. I think Vince McMahon is underrated as not just like, of course, a wrestler, you know, but the brain of a a cultural phenomenon. And I don't think people will understand it until... You know, but years after he, you know, uh, years after he passed away or something like that, man. But hopefully not. But uh, I think he's super underrated as, uh, you know, he might have had the biggest cultural movement of our lifetime. I mean, you know, the thing, too, you know, as a businessman, too, this man was pretty much just born into doing sports. I actually did an article about this for a website. You know, this man was pretty much, you know, born and, you know, being a businessman for different types of sports. You had his father, you know, Vincent J. McMahon, who, you know, got into wrestling. You know, he helped found the Capital Wrestling Corporation, which is the WWE today. You know, Mm -hmm. you had his grandfather, Jess McMahon, who put together a lot of different basketball games between white and black players, you know, back then. Because this was the 20s when he was doing that. Mm -hmm. So... You know, you had all these different guys, you know, just putting different things together, being able to make something out of themselves. And, you know, it's just a, you know, line of self-starters, really, you know, something that me and you were trying to aspire to be. You with strong men, you know, me with radio and comedy. I love the gym, but, you know, that's more of a hobby for me, something I love to follow, something I love to do. And I like the fact that, you know, I could just compete with myself when I go to the gym, and, you know, that's something I would never want to lose. I have yeah. thought about getting into a powerlifting meet to try it, but mm-hmm. I don't know if I would continue to do it afterward. Cause you know, again, I love competing with myself. So at most probably a couple, but you know, I would love to pick his brain too. Cause here's the thing. I would have always loved to pick the undertaker's brain before he did all those different interviews. Mm-hmm. You know, he did all these interviews where everybody finally got to pick his brain. He rolled back the curtain, and once he did, everybody started asking The Undertaker for interviews, and he was, you know, letting everybody give him the interviews. So you finally got to, you know, pick the brain of him a little bit, you know, see a little bit inside of The Undertaker. I don't think – I didn't think you were going to get that chance with The Undertaker, but I don't – I definitely don't think you'll get that chance with Vince McMahon. So I'm with you on that. I'd love to be able to pick his brain, too. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I know that you was a lot know, of stuff. Man. Yeah, I was about to say, you <laughs> never know. Somebody, you, you, a lot of people would probably never think that Julius would do an interview, you know, yeah. with this strong man, you know. So you never know, you know, the the you, 
universal principle, right, is that we're only a, a certain amount of degrees from each other. I'm pretty sure that I know somebody or somebody's probably listening to this or watching this right now who knows somebody who knows somebody who knows Vince McMahon. And we never know how the universe yeah. can conspire to, you know, put those things into play. But, you know, it's just our job to put it out there and to uh, to follow, you know, follow that right. lane that we out there. So, yeah, man. Worst thing, worst thing somebody could say is no, too. That's the thing. That's it, brother. That's and the then worst you keep thing going back you. again. <laughs> Let them tell you exactly. no again and again. <laughs> oh, you oh, you gonna are you you gonna keep saying no? Oh, we'll see. Careful. <laughs> yeah, but uh we I got to enjoy wrestling for a second, man. But again, I wanna thank you for being on. I really, really appreciate it. Definitely wanna have you back again for sure. Absolutely, man. Anytime, brother, thank you so much and uh appreciate you as well. All right, and when this pandemic is over, I definitely got to meet up and hopefully try a strongman competition after a little bit of training in the sport. Oh, man, that's uh, that's what I wanted to tell you. You just got to do it, man. The powerlifting yeah. contest, you just got to do it. And whether you decide to continue afterwards, that's not your business right now. Right now, you yeah. know, if you feel like you want to do it, just go out, do it, see where you're at, you know, train for it hard, stay healthy. Right. Try it out and just, just see where you're at. And keep that I'm mindset that you compete with yourself. Yeah. But thank you again. Appreciate you, brother. All good, brother. Thank you. All right. Anyways, everybody, this has been the round table on HamiltonRadio.net channel HR2. I'm your host, John Brecco. This has been Big Tommy Burns on the show. Yeah, buddy. We'll be back, we will be back same time, same channel next week. So make sure you catch us. Deuces. Peace. I'm actually born from the static See, ass to be crazy I'm trying to be amazing Next big thing kind of has a nice ring Bada boom, bada bing You love it when I go off When you're so lost and it's so awesome I get it cause I am from where the stars from Hamash and the boogie down's the mother man Cool arcs the overlord and we are just a cover band I love the land I'm in but everyone's opinionated Insinuating the word and sin Only then you hate it I'm always getting so high so you can gaze up